days of live shows, food, and fun. The Boston Calling Music Festival is taking over four stages with legends, up and coming artists, and underground bands about to bust out. It's gonna be so fun, dude. In the next half hour, you'll see the history. First festival launched on City Hall Plaza in 2013. Hear from performers who call Boston home. <laughs> and check out some of the tasty treats you'll enjoy when you go. This food's really um, steeped in nostalgia. All that and much more to look forward to in this WBZ Boston Calling Music Festival special. Welcome to the WBZ Boston Calling Festival Special. I'm Lisa Hughes. This three-day concert has become one of the most popular events of the year, with tens of thousands of people packing into the grounds here at the Harvard Athletic Complex to see their favorite bands. And again this year, the lineup is incredible. Here's a guide so you know what to expect at this year's show. It all kicks off on Friday. The Foo Fighters, Yeah Yeah Yeahs, The National, Niall Horan, Chelsea Cutler, and one of the biggest emerging bands from Boston, Little Fuss. The Foo Fighters were actually scheduled to play Boston Calling last year, but had to cancel. And fans are eager to see the band that's now in the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. Yeah Yeah Yeahs lead singer Karen O oh has collaborated with a host of artists wrote and produced the soundtrack for Where the Wild Things Are and has established herself as a music fashion icon. The National was instrumental in the launch of Boston Calling, appearing in the first festival and several times since. On Saturday, it's the Lumineers, Alanis Morissette, rising star Noah Kahan, a New England native, the Flaming Lips, and Mount Joy. The Lumineers first hit it big about a decade ago with the single Ho Hey, and later appeared on the soundtrack of the first Hunger Games film. Grammy winner Alanis Morissette shot to stardom in the mid-90s with her album Jagged Little Pill, and went on to success with a number of follow-ups in the 2000s. And Noah Kahan's Stick Season album struck a chord. It was written during the pandemic and came out last year. He recorded it at his home in Vermont. Then, to close out the festival, Paramore, Queens of the Stone Age, Bleachers, King Gizzard and the Lizard Wizard, Marin Morris, The Walkman, and the Boston-based band Couch. Paramore formed in Tennessee, frontwoman Haley Williams. They rocked onto the scene with Misery Business in 2007. The band's latest release is This Is Why, came out in February. Jack Antonoff is frontman for Bleachers, but he may be best known for producing Taylor Swift and a number of other artists. He's also the drummer and guitarist in the Grammy-winning band Fun. And Maren Morris's music is rooted in country, but it spans several genres. She cut her first record when she was 15 and reached top 10 success with the dance song The Middle. So when will your favorite band be playing? Well, here's an outlook for Friday. Some of the bigger names. Chelsea Cutler takes the stage at 445, The National at 555, Yeah Yeah Yeahs are set up for 705, and Foo Fighters will take the stage at 840. Then, on Saturday, Mount Joy comes out at 455, local favorite Noah Kahan at 605. Then Alanis Morissette is expected to begin her set at 715, and the Lumineers round out the night at 9 o'clock. And on the festival's final day, Sunday, Bleachers go on at 5.05, Marin Morris at 6.15, Queens of the Stone Age begin at 7.25, and Paramore ends it all with a 9 o'clock start time. This place will be packed when the doors open, so what's the best way to get here? Well, the festival recommends taking the red line to the Harvard Square Station and taking the 10-minute walk to the main entrance on North Harvard Street. Be aware, there is no street parking in the surrounding communities, and city officials say they will be strict with ticketing and towing. So if you're coming from outside the city, the commuter rail goes into Boston Landing Station, and that's about a mile walk to the show. They also recommend taking ride shares. And if you have a bike, the festival will have bicycle parking on site. It's been a decade since Boston Calling launched on City Hall Plaza back in 2013, and a lot has changed since then, starting with this great outdoor space at the Harvard Athletic Complex. 
But even as it evolves, the co-founders and producers say they never waver from their focus on the music, the fan experience, and the spirit of the event they created. It was the crooning of the shins, fun, and the national that kicked it all off in 2013. More than 20,000 people packed City Hall Plaza in May to rock out. And they came back that September. Going for, a drive. for the first three years, the festival held two shows, one in the spring, one in the fall, and set a new standard for live music in Boston. Early 2010s, we had come up with an idea for a ticketed, fenced-in event at City Hall Plaza. Producers Mike Snow and Brian Appel say they came up with the idea working at the old rock radio station WFNX. That's how we got started back in 2012 and the first festival launched on City Hall Plaza in 2013. And there was definitely a learning curve. We did get it all done, but a lot of overnights uh, sold out, you know, very early in the process, so we knew how many people were coming. and. Uh, we learned a lot about how to use the plaza and how to maximize the plaza for, for the guests that first time. Super fans like Jessica Acosta say the Government Center location felt unique. It was that aura of like going to downtown Boston to see a festival, then coming to City Hall and seeing it live, all these people, live music. It was crazy and I was like, I'm like, this is great. And while those shows were special, with so many fans, the move to Alston became a necessity. It's almost like it was in its toddler stage in City Hall, and then coming to Alston, it became like they're a teenager now. Like they're fully becoming a festival. But once we were able to make the move, and the first show here being in 2017, we felt that this was the right decision. This just is an incredible opportunity and an amazing site to host a festival. The current location at Harvard Stadium allows Mike and Brian to put together a full festival feel, from vendors, to amusements, to food. We have a, a food concessionaire. That's kind of another thing that separates us from festivals. We actually have 30 individual uh, food vendors. Some of them have brick and mortar, some of them have food trucks. Um, and that's kind of like our lineup. We curate that every year. Um, we change it up every year. We've had some, some great people that have been with us a long time. Roxy's Grilled Cheese, uh, Smoke Shop Barbecue, Tasty Burger. Um, and then we try to mix it up every year with what's currently happening in the city. Uh, we curate in our platinum section to have specific chefs from, from different Boston uh, area restaurant groups. And when it comes to their favorite moments... I was a huge Metallica fan growing up as a kid, musician, you know, that was like my band. So to have that moment when they get on the stage and you're standing there and you're seeing it, you know, that's when for a half an hour, an hour, you know, it, it's completely surreal. <laughs> When we had a significant rainstorm come through in 2014 and we had to evacuate the City Hall Plaza site and we had to ask Lord to stay and postpone her set and hold uh, on her performance until we were able to readmit everybody. And this was right as Lord was, you know, totally ascending um, to the superstar that she's become. And she took the stage after the rain delay and everybody came back in and it was just lightning in a bottle. And expectations for this year are even higher. Foo Fighters. We've booked them. This is the fifth time now we've had the Foo Fighters okay. confirmed and the first time they're actually going to play, hopefully. So we are thrilled that they're part of it this year. Um, Alanis Morissette, like it's just an awesome lineup this year. We've never had the Yeah, Yeah, Yeahs. They are incredible live. So, you know, there's, there's just a lot to look forward to this year. Thank you. Yeah. This year's Boston Calling features more female fronted bands than ever before, including the up and coming Boston based Little Fuss. They're playing on Friday night. They were nominated for a Boston Music Award even before they released their debut album. And as Christina Rex shows us, they're making a name for themselves with a pop rock sound and a feminist perspective. Oh, are we doing it now? This is it? It's starting. I guess so. <laughs> <laughs> Look, Custer's been eyeing me. I've got a bad feeling and she's got a job to do. In a Boston apartment near Berklee College of Music, two members of the band known as Little Fuss give WBZ an impromptu concert. I'm playing 
Wanted. All of Martinez and Cody Von Lemden are the founding members. And they found each other during a chance meeting studying abroad in Spain. We just immediately like, you know, shared the same music taste and everything and we immediately started writing demos. I feel like we share a lot of the same like yeah. musical tendencies. You're the only person who I feel like it just sort of happens. Olive is lead vocals while Cody plays guitar. Later, Vitor Olivero is drums and Delia Martin on bass. Olive says she focuses many of their songs on feminism. Even if it's not like specifically like a girl anthem or like girl power anthem or whatever, I feel like a lot of the songs are more so focused on um, like a female narrator and her experience. Don't tell me I don't know how I feel. And their sound is a mix of old and new. I feel like it's a good kind of middle ground between like classic rock arrangements that feel familiar to a listener while also having a lot that is hopefully new and fresh. The four Berkeley students will be playing Boston Calling, part of the festival's investment in homegrown talent. There, they'll be entertaining fans and will be fans themselves. I heard like an Alanis Morissette song on the radio and like started crying. Because <laughs> I was like, this is just so cool. I mean, who gets to say yeah. that they did that? It's going to be so fun, dude. And while all of them saw forming a band as part of their journey, not everyone saw so much success so soon. For me, I expected to do it, but I didn't think it would be doing as well. <laughs> if that makes sense, that's fair. Yeah. That's a good, crazy ride so far. Yeah. yeah. Coming up, a band collaborating long distance even before the pandemic. How Boston-based Couch got comfortable in their early days trading chords online. Another Massachusetts band that will be filling the stage with its sound is Couch. Its members are on horns, drums, guitars, and vocals. And as Tiffany Chan shows us, the band members started making music hundreds of miles apart. Whether it's having some fun in the WBZ rec room, giving us an interview, <laughs> or performing one of their songs. The members of Couch seem to be having a pretty good time. All but one of the members of this seven piece band are from Massachusetts. We all grew up in the greater Boston area and met each other through school, synagogue, various musical groups. Led by lead singer Tema Siegel, they started playing together in 2018. I remember in high school really wanting to be in a band and not really understanding how that happened, how I could how I could meet the people that I, that I would hit it off with definitely didn't um, predict that I would find six other people to do that with. However, they quickly headed off to college, but that didn't stop them from creating music, becoming a long distance band. We're writing music virtually through FaceTime or Zoom, sending a lot of files back and forth. And that prepared them for when the pandemic hit. We sort of knew how to handle that situation of not being able to rehearse together, but still having to produce music. But that's no fun for me, that's why I'm singing. Na, 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 na. Their music is a mix of funk, jazz, and rock, and it's all one big collaboration. Some of these funk bands are huge influences for me that I think a lot of us try to emulate. Earth, Wind & Fire, Tower of Power, just the good stuff. We've got different people involved in production. It's it's a whole hodgepodge. I think it's easiest to start with like one or two people, but by the end, we have to get everybody involved. The band says the horns can bring a lot of onstage energy. It really just brings a whole nother layer, in my opinion, of energy to the live performance. Now they're getting ready for Boston Calling, a showcase all of them have been working toward. I like to think that we just made our presence known in Boston as one of those bands that was working hard and on the way up and, and we're really grateful to be featured. What's it like? This crew has done a lot of touring in their young careers. And one night Will's bass string broke, like yeah, the last set. song? Oh, yeah. it was mid-set? Yeah. Okay. 
Well, I couldn't tell. After the festival, their future is back on the road for more shows. We've been developing our sound and touring as much as we possibly can. And if that tour ever came to Fenway one day... We're just huge Sox fans, so being able to play there would be a dream come true. A dream that seems in sight for this talented group. Still to come, it is the main attraction, but music isn't the only draw for the fans coming to Boston Calling. We're going to show you what's on the menu for concert goers and introduce you to one of the owners of a Cambridge deli, serving up a taste of nostalgia and community. Music is the focus, but no one is going hungry or thirsty at Boston Calling. With 30 vendors, that lineup is as varied as the music, with big names like Tasty Burger to local favorites like Mamala's. And one of the owners of that Cambridge deli shared with Paula Eben what it's like to serve fans at Boston Calling. Getting ready for Boston Calling takes a lot of work. Especially if you're one of the food vendors who will be feeding thousands and thousands of people. We're going to be doing bagel dogs, um, everything bagel dogs. Mamala's Delicatessen in Cambridge is returning to the festival this year and their treats should not be missed. The bagel dogs are new for us this year and that's been a fun, um, fun new project. Um, and is certainly like a great walking food. Rachel Sundet is part owner and pastry chef at Mamalus. She says the bagel dogs are just the appetizer to an even more delectable entree. We're also doing latke fries traditionally and then also loaded latke fries. You can get either veggie or ones with pastrami on them too. So it's basically, it's kind of like all the, all the Jewish deli bits of a Reuben sandwich, but on our latke fries. They're just gonna go into the fryer. Latkes are a staple of Jewish menus, and that type of tradition is extremely important at Mamalas. This food's really um, steeped in nostalgia, and um, it feels very personal to everyone. And Sundet hopes her deli can play a role in keeping these culinary customs alive. Kids that grew up eating Jewish deli stuff with their parents, now as they're getting older and maybe having kids, providing a place that they can bring their kids and then keep the, the stories going. Um, I think it's been really rewarding. And that sense of community will expand even further on Memorial Day weekend when they help mix amazing eats with incredible music. Just getting out of the restaurant, getting to be interacting with tons of people, getting to be so close to really great music. And don't forget those latke fries and bagel dogs. A few employees got a preview and well, it seemed pretty tasty. Coming up, the local indie rock band whose founding members met at work and how long they've been preparing for their Boston Calling debut. The final featured Boston band in our special is Coral Moons. Now, they joined us on WBZ's The Morning Mix earlier this month and performed their single, Winnebago. Lead singer Carly Kraft grew up in upstate New York but moved to the Boston area for a job in tech where she met bassist Manuel Camacho. It's Coral Moons' first Boston Calling, and the band says, wait. I actually feel like we're very prepared this year. We we just did a tour up, up in March and went down the Eastern Seaboard, which is great, and then uh, basically we're kind of taking the week to experiment with some new uh, arrangements and adding some instruments, and uh, so basically every night we're practicing <laughs> to get ready. Carly says they'll be releasing a new LP in the summer of 2024, and if anyone wants a preview, now they'll hear it at Boston Calling. Thanks for joining us for this WBZ Boston Calling Music Festival special. It's been great being with you. Enjoy the show.